Welcome everyone. Welcome to today's lecture on control for self-driving cars. So we'll look into different strategies for actually controlling a car along a desired trajectory. Uh, we'll uh, look into the concepts of feedback control and how to use this idea to actually smoothly drive our car autonomously along some, uh, some path that would be calculated, say, using uh, a path planner. We'll also look then into the modeling of a, uh, of a car, so the kinematic modeling, and to see how the controls affect these cars and use them within these controllers uh, to exploit this knowledge. And we'll also look at a control law which can be obtained as a result of an optimization problem and uh, see what advantages that this kind of controllers give. So broadly speaking, we'll look at different strategies to control uh, a car along a desired trajectory. And the goal is to uh, develop these control laws which obey certain rules and give us smooth uh, driving experience for a self-driving car. So this lecture is a part of the ongoing series of uh, uh, ongoing course on self-driving uh, cars, so techniques for self-driving cars as it's called. And this is being presented with my colleagues here as you can see here and it's my pleasure to uh, to give today's lecture on the control aspects. So I look into the different aspects involving the control of a self-driving car. So let's get started. So this is a typical scenario that you would see for a self-driving car. Say you are on the road or the car is on the road and this is the front view that you have. Now the car must decide what to do next, right? And this involves several steps. This involves first, for example, understanding the world around you. So understanding which parts of this world, for example, are traversable. So you're only allowed to go, say, for example, on these roads, but not on the pathways here. So this is one kind of understanding that is necessary. And then once you say no, what, are, what is good areas to go, what is not good areas to go, you also should understand the semantics. For example, there's a green light, therefore you are allowed to go in front uh, or if it was red, you would have to stop and so on. So there are certain rules that this environment imposes on the car. So once all this thing is done, you also need to then figure out how should I go? This depends of course where you want to go. So say you have a planner which says you need to go to a particular position and this would determine how you, uh, how you reach this uh, particular goal. And to do this, uh, you usually generate a trajectory and follow this trajectory as smoothly as possible possible. So let's see how this strategy is usually done for a, a self-driving car. So usually there are these different levels at which you need to control your car. And at the top is what I was talking about perception. So this would include, say, traversability analysis. So this means that where uh, or which parts of the environment are free, which are occupied, and not just in terms of, let's say, it's free or occupied, but also if it's valid to drive in that particular area. So for example, you're not allowed to drive in the opposite direction or you're not allowed to drive in the lanes for the bicycles or so on. So this kind of analysis is the traversability analysis. And we also need to understand the semantics, which is to understand where are the cars, where are the people and other rules in the environment. So this is dealt within the, uh, the block, which is usually called as perception. Then once you kind of perceive your environment, you need to then plan a trajectory. Now you know what are free spaces and you want to now plan a trajectory through this free space, which would then eventually take you someplace and with taking you this someplace can be given by a plan, which you would, uh, for example, pre-compute. Say this is the output of something like a Google Maps or some other uh, navigation system. So these are blocks that we won't be considering in this lecture today, but would be the topics of discussion of the future lectures. What we'll primarily focus today is these two bottom blocks, which are control and actuation. So what this means is that once you have a trajectory you want to follow, how should you actually do the control along these two directions? So here we say longitudinal, uh, we mean along the direction of the motion of the car and lateral meaning uh, the steering, so to say, so as to reduce the error or the cross track error as it's called to our desired uh, trajectory. And finally, to do this, we actually need to apply some control, some physical actuation is needed. And this is usually done via the throttle or the brake in order to go faster or slower. And of course, to steer your car using the steering wheel. So what we'll primarily focus today is these two aspects of control and actu actuation. And the goal would be the following. So 
if we are given a trajectory to follow like this one here in green, which has been computed during your motion planning step, the goal would be how do I actually now follow this particular trajectory here. So when I say a trajectory, it means a couple of things. One, of course, it means the physical path that you see here, but also it means something more in terms of the velocity you want to achieve while you travel on this uh, particular uh, path here. So for each point, let's say here on this trajectory, we want to reach a particular velocity. And usually this velocity is set in a way that the overall experience for the, for the passenger, so to say, in sitting in the car is, uh, is, is smooth and not jerky. And of course, we must follow the laws that are there. So if this road has a maximum speed of 30 kilometers per hour, it must also follow these kind of rules. So today we'll look into different strategies on how to actually perform uh, this kind of tracking, uh, given the fact that we have a trajectory already, which we know how to track uh, or which we need to track. Then the next question that comes immediately is, if I want to track this uh, particular trajectory, then what is the steering angle that I should set or how much should I press on the gas and how much should I press on the brake in order to actually uh, follow this uh, uh, trajectory efficiently. So this is how humans would do it too. So we would, uh, we would uh, rotate the steering wheel and press on the gas or the brake to control the car. Of course, in an autonomous car, you need not physically do this, but the idea is the same that you need to, to steer your car or steer, you, steer your wheels so that you track your uh, trajectory or your desired trajectory. And so this is the basic question that we ask in this uh, lecture. What are the controls in order to move my car along a, a trajectory? And we'll see different ways of doing this. But before we actually look into the controls aspect, we first need to understand the motion of the car itself. And in this lecture, we'll limit our, uh, our motion analysis or motion modeling to the velocities. So we'll model the motion for a car using its linear velocity v and its angular velocity omega. And this, so to say, would uh, completely define the, uh, the dynamics of the car as it moves or the kinematics of the car as it uh, moves. So we need to understand, given certain uh, commands, what kind of velocity and angular velocity the, that the car gets. And this is done through kinematic modeling. So uh, in, the, in the upcoming slides, we will look at a simple model as to how the controls as well as the system's path state themselves affect the motion. So if you are moving at, let's say, 30 kilometers of, uh, an hour, then your next position will depend on how fast you were moving in the previous position and where you were. And of course, it also depends on the control that you give. So how much gas you push or how much throttle you give or the steering angle that you put. And this would affect the overall uh, linear velocity and the angular velocity for the car. And uh, for this, we'll basically in this lecture limit ourselves to this simple model called as the 2D bicycle model. So essentially, instead of considering the whole car, we have a simplified model with two wheels. Uh, so of course, our car has four wheels, but in this case, we uh, uh, approximate with this with an ideal wheel which sits in the back in the middle of the two axes uh, uh, with the wheels and a steerable front wheel. On the, in the real car, this would then translate to the fact that the way you would steer this wheel would result in different steerings for the left and the right wheel. But we'll consider this simplified model as it keeps the overall complexity uh, in check and also is enough to understand and also model realistic situations. So as I show here, this is the bicycle model and the, some of the terms that or some of the variables that we're interested here are shown here. So this V is the linear velocity. And since it's a rigid object, all the points must move with this linear velocity. And then we have uh, the orientation of our car uh, uh, given by theta. And we also have a delta, which is the steering angle of the front wheel. So by changing the delta, we could then change the angular velocity and therefore make a, a curve, for example. All right. So this is how we actually model our car. So at least the geometric parts of those uh, model. And then we have certain conditions which we want to respect. So one of these conditions is, the, is that of rolling conditions for the wheel. This means that the wheel always rolls and it never skids. And one of the advantages of this is that the friction then on the wheel is limited and we obtain a smooth motion. 
So uh, in our modeling, we'll always want to achieve a smooth motion of the tire. So we always want the, uh, the wheel to roll. And what this means kinematically is that if our wheel is moving, uh, is having a linear velocity of V, then it has an angular velocity which is given by the product of the R, which is the radius of your wheel, times the, uh, the angular velocity itself, omega. So we would always respect this law that the uh, linear velocity is R times the angular velocity along which it rotates. So if this is true for all points or on, uh, on our wheel, then this ensures that we, ro we roll smoothly on top, of the, uh, on top of the ground. So this is for each tire. But in our bicycle model or in our model for the car, you, we have multiple tires, right? So the rolling condition must hold for each of the tires, but also as a system, it must roll smoothly. And this brings us to the concept of the instant, instantaneous center of curvature. Uh, what, what, means, what this means is that as a system, as a, 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 for, for our car, there exists one point, this ICC, the instantaneous center, about which we are rotating. So you can think of our, uh, our bicycle model as a point mass, which then is rotating about this ICC with this particular omega. And in order for this to happen, there's a particular geometric cons uh, uh, constraint that must be satisfied. And this constraint is that the axis that passes through these wheels, so here I call it the y-axis, so these must intersect at a common point always. So no, no matter with what velocity this, uh, the, the car moves, we should ensure that these axes always meet at the same point. And if they don't meet at the same point, this means that we would be skidding in that case. The, the rolling motion would no longer be, uh, be satisfied. So with this, uh, uh, with this in mind, we always want to generate such commands. So our controllers should generate such commands such that this ICC condition is always uh, up, uphold, right? upheld. Uh, and with this, I move next to using these concepts here and the variables that I have introduced here. So I've introduced a new variable here, which is R, which is this uh, radius of the uh, circle about which our car would be rotating. And another term which would keep coming is this L, uh, which is the distance between the rear and the front wheel. So this is, so to say, the length of the car so in, in, a, uh, in this model. So with this, we can actually then derive the kinematic model for this uh, bicycle, uh, bicycle model, which actually approximates a car. And the kinematics are like this. So how does my X position evolve? How does my Y position evolve? And how does my orientation evolve? So this is what the kinematics captures. And in this particular uh, model, we consider the center of the rear axis as the point which we want to track. This means that the controller that we will develop would actually say act on this point such that this point is as close to the trajectory, the desired trajectory as possible. So it's a matter of choice. There are different ways in which this point could be chosen. One could also say this is at the center of gravity of this uh, car, or one could even fix that at, uh, at the front wheel. And we'll see that by changing these different uh, reference values, the properties of the controllers themselves often change. And uh, later on today, we'll see uh, a controller which actually does this change and see what advantages uh, it has. But for, for this uh, slide here and to in general to understand the kinematics, let's fix this point we want to track here. All right, then uh, we have these following constraints. So the, the, uh, the motion in the x direction is basically the velocity that it has times the cosine. Uh, so if x direction is this way, and similarly, the y direction is y times of sine of your orientation. And finally, we also obtain a constraint for the change in the orientation as v tan delta by L. And this formula can be obtained using, uh, the, using some, some basic trigonometry in this triangle here and replacing for the fact that omega actually is the angular rotation, which means the rate of change of our orientation. So if we just compute the tan of delta here, we have L over R, and then substitute that in here, we get the, uh, get the, uh, get the kinematics, so to say, or the motion for the change in our yaw rate or the heading, right? So with this, now we have some formulas, so a model of uh, uh, to predict, so to say, where we will end up, given that we have a certain velocity V 
and a certain steering uh, angle delta over the next time step. So this helps us model the motion of a car using this bicycle model. Right. So we can uh, kind of uh, put all things together in this uh, slide here. So in order to track this particular car or this model, our state consists of the following variables, the X and the Y position of the car. So in this case, the rear axle position, uh, the orientation theta and the steering angle delta. So these four uh, variables would, uh, uh, would explain completely our motion at any given time. Then we have our controls, which is the linear velocity that we want to uh, set to the car and the rate of change of the steering. One could also argue that this could directly be the steering angle. In this case, we model it as the rate of steering because usually in practice, we can't arbitrarily set a steering angle, but rather we do this smoothly and therefore it, it helps to actually control the rate of steering angle rather than the steering angle directly. And then we have this particular uh, condition that this delta, so the steering angle must uh, uphold this particular uh, uh, relation here, which is given by tan inverse of L over R. And this is necessary, if you remember, to, uh, to have a consistent ICC point. So if we take the tan of delta, we would find that it's basically L over R. And this would mean that by keeping the delta such that it's, it holds this formula, this means that we will always have our wheels intersecting at an uh, ICC point. Right. And then we've seen the kinematics which are given by these three equations. So this is the overall uh, bicycle model which we'll use throughout this lecture to describe the motion of our car. Then we saw the kinematics, but then there are also some constraints that are put onto our car. For example, there's a maximum velocity that our car can reach. So in this case, we denote it by Vmax. So no matter how much more throttle you give, our car can't make more power in order to reach a, a higher velocity. So this is some physical constraint that comes from the construction of the car, from the engine that it has and so on. And then we also have a, a limit on the uh, on the steering uh, angle. So this means that we can only turn the uh, the the steering wheel so much and if effectively we can only turn the wheel on the car so much. So this is given by delta max. So in this case, this delta would be between, let's say, minus delta max to delta max. So these are some physical constraints that come uh, out of the construction of the car itself. And whatever control law that we develop must also, op uh, must also kind of uh, follow these constraints in order for them to be effective. Okay, so we saw basically the kinematics, the constraints, there are some things in this lecture that we won't really look into. So what we said that by, by controlling our brake and accelerator as well as the steering wheel, we are able to obtain a particular velocity, a linear and an angular velocity. But in practice, there are several forces which are actually acting on our car. So as the car is moving, there is certain air resistance, some friction from the, uh, from the ground. So for example, if we are on on a, on, an, uh, on a road, on an asphalt road versus an outdoor road, this kind of friction would vary. Then we have certain lateral forces. So as we say uh, on a curve, we have some centripetal forces acting on a car. And also say if we are going up or down a hill, there is certain gradient forces or due to the gravity that is acting on a car. But when we take this simplistic view of, of being able to set a particular linear and angular velocity, we are in a way, uh, not considering all these forces that act on the car. So uh, uh, if, you, if you want to be really precise, we should also take these into account while developing a control law. In this lecture, we'll focus ourselves to this simple model and see that the concepts in a way uh, propagate to the, uh, to the cases where you have these forces too, but the equations are usually much larger and a bit more complicated. So we make this simplifying assumption that we are able to set a particular linear and angular velocity uh, and don't consider all the forces that are usually acting on the, uh, on the car. So this is a simplifying assumption that we make. Right, so now we move on to the actuation part, right? So we saw how the, uh, how the uh, car moves over time, but now we want to understand what's the effect that, uh, that our actuators have on on the car or what is it that the actuators can actually uh, can do and in this case we have two actuation mechanisms one is the steering wheel and by moving the steering wheel we can set the angle for our uh, for our let's say the front wheel of our car or the front wheels of our car 
And in this case, we also assume a very uh, simple model. It's a linear model. So this means that if you uh, rotate your steering wheel by delta S, this would be directly proportional to the amount you would uh, actually uh, move the wheel. So for simplifying, in the simplest case, if you consider KS as one, this would mean that the wheel would move as much as your steering, uh, uh, as, as you would move the steering wheel itself, right? And of course, this has a constraint that you can only move your steering wheel so much. So this is a very simple model as to how your steering affects the actual physical state of the uh, of your car. And in this case, let's say our bicycle model. How does the, the steering angle change as I change my uh, angle on the steering wheel? Right. So you change your or you move your steering wheel. This sets a different uh, uh, angle for your uh, front wheel. And this results in a different curvature that you can actually follow. So in, in reality, again, here we make certain simplifying assumptions. Usually, uh, when you make a particular turn, it's not that you can directly set this angle to delta because there are certain lateral forces that are acting on this wheel. And then it becomes also important to model how the tires respond to different forces that are there. So again, for this lecture, we use the simpli simplified linear model. So the wheel moves as much as your, or is proportional to your movement of the steering wheel. Okay, the next part is the throttling part. And right? so to throttling or the braking part. So this is, this sets your, uh, or this gives you velocity, this gives you forward motion for your car. And the way it does is that uh, the more, so this delta T is, 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 the, is the amount you say press on your accelerator and delta B is the amount you press your brake. And what we see, say is that the amount you press your accelerator is directly proportional to the acceleration that you can generate. And so if you press your, uh, if, you, if you give full throttle to your car, it means that you can reach this maximum acceleration that your car is capable of. And the same uh, uh, in the case of a brake, but in the case of a brake, it would be a deceleration instead of an acceleration. So the way, you, the way this would work is that you would press your accelerator or the brake, your car will gain certain acceleration. And finally, uh, by applying this acceleration over a period of time, it would, either increase or decrease its linear velocity. So this is the way you can actually control the velocity by physical interaction or basically by pushing these uh, brakes and throttles on the car. So we have seen basically kinematics for the car. We have seen how to actually change these states, so which means to change the velocity and the angular, uh, angular velocity for the car by uh, through our actuation mechanisms. So now we need to look into mechanisms of how to actually use this knowledge or uh, to use this knowledge to come up with a control law which would help us finally uh, let's say either reach a position or to uh, follow a desired trajectory and for this i would like to introduce the concept of feedback control and this is a very uh, common uh, way of controlling systems to to bring it to your desired systems uh, to desired state and usually you see it as a let's say as opposites to either open loop system or feedback uh, systems. So open loop usually means that you have certain system, in this case, it's our car. You give some certain uh, commands, so this is the controller which gives certain commands to the system and this reaches to a new position. So if our systems were completely predictable and we know the exact modeling of how this system evolves, then this is sufficient. We know where we want to go, we give a particular command and the system executes that perfectly. But we know that this is not the case in most real systems, including the car. So even if we give a particular command, depending on the speed you are, depending on the road conditions, etc., you might not exactly end up where you plan for, right? And this is where the idea of feedback control comes, where what you do is that you give a command to your system, but then you measure, that, uh, uh, the, measure the state of the system using a sensor. So this could be, let's say in the ca case of uh, a car, could be a GPS uh, uh, sensor or could be a LiDAR scanner, a camera or whatever. Using this sensor data, you have an estimate of where you are. And then basically you compute a difference between where you want to be, so this X desired, versus where you sense to be. And then this difference is what goes to the controller. And the idea here is that if the difference is large, the controller should generate 
uh, controls which are larger and if the uh, if this difference is zero for example it should generate ideally no controls so that the system has already reached our desired goal so this is the concept of feedback control where we continuously measure the current state and compare it against the desired state in order to uh, compute our controller against uh, the open loop control where we only know where we want to go but we don't really know where we are at the current moment and just use this knowledge uh, of where we want to go as well as the model that we have in order to do the control. So in this lecture we'll primarily be, primarily be looking at uh, schemes or strategies which are of this feedback control type. Hey, right. uh, so just to make it a little bit more formal, uh, what we say is the controller gets in as input an error signal, which is basically your desired position minus what you sense. So in this case, there's a little bit more than just sensing going on there. Usually the sensor either does not observe your complete state or you need some more processing or you need some modeling to get your, uh, your, uh, get your uh, state, so to say, from your sensor measurements. Right, so there's something a little bit more going on in the sense that there's this function uh, uh, f here which actually looks into the uh, into the measurements and then converts into your current state. So this there are lots of techniques to do this, lots of state estimation techniques. You can think of a Kalman filter or some other modeling which would actually give you uh, your current state based on your uh, based on your observations. Okay, so let's say you know where you want to go. You have an estimate of where you are. You have this error signal then the goal is to is to compute this u which is a function of your error signal so we want such a signal which would then drive the system to reach our desired position right so the controller would generate ut which would then affect the system to move based on its kinematics and of course other noise that would for example be acting in the real world so for example here this part is the actual or the modeling that we have so this could be let's say the bicycle model for the car but in practice there's actually also some noise that's happening uh, due to the lack of perfect commands or some external disturbances so this is let's say the overall setup of a feedback control and if we talk particularly of this feedback control for a self-driving car case this essentially means that the controller should generate my commands which here are the steering rate as well as how much should I press the gas and the throttle in order to uh, to make my car or in order to drive my car to have a desired velocity and angular velocity desired linear and angular velocity so this would be the goal uh, that in the next few slides we see using one particular uh, kind of controller right. okay so now we go on to the first kind of feedback controller that we see today and this is the popular uh, PID controller where P, I and D stand for proportional, integral and derivative uh, terms. And then we'll actually see how we can uh, use a PID controller to achieve our task of finally following a trajectory. But before doing that, we actually understand the concept of the PID controller and what these different terms do on a simpler task, which is of position control. What it means here is that we have a desired position uh, x desired and we want to reach to this desired position. Right? So in this case there's just one goal and not really a trajectory where, you, where this goal keeps changing. So we do this so that we can see what the effects of these different terms are and it's a bit easier to analyze. The question is always the same. So in terms of control, what's the control signal u such that I reach this desired position? And for this example, actually, we would say that we are in a one dimension world and we only want to uh, control our, uh, our velocity through our throttle so that we reach this goal position here. And we also assume uh, for the sake of simplicity that our measurements Z also give us directly the position of where my uh, robot is. So you could think of this as a very accurate GPS sensor, which always tells me where I am. Right. And uh, for modeling the kinematics, uh, we also take a simplified model, not the bicycle model, but even a simplified model where we consider a car as a point mass with a certain velocity shown here by x dot and its position is shown by x here. So the way the uh, system would evolve is that the new position, let's say at time t plus one would be your position at time t plus this velocity times the delta t that has, uh, that has happened in between. Right. And just to make the task concrete, let's say we start at x equals to zero 
and we want to reach the desired position at x test equals to 1. And uh, basically at each time instant we apply a control ut. So this would be pressing off your throttle for example in this case. And the goal is how do I reach smoothly to this x desired position uh, using this control. And like I said, so the system model or the way the system evolves, so the kinematics of the system so to say is that the new position of the, of the car would be the old position uh, plus the velocity that you had in the previous time times the delta t. So the delta t is the amount of time for which you actually apply this control. So this would define the system uh, kinematics. And let's say we start at this initial state where our x position is at zero. And uh, what we see here are three different things. So in red is shown the position of the robot. And then in, in, the, in the slides to come, we'll see also the xt, which is basically the derivative or the velocity of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the robot or the car in this case. And then x desired, which is basically this one. So we want to reach to this position one as quickly as possible. And on the lower side, we will see the different components of the, of the PID controller, which contribute towards the final control. So let's see how this works. Let's say we only use the proportional idea of the PID or the proportional term of the PID, which means that our control law is some proportion is proportional to the error that you have. So the error is nothing but your desired position minus your current position. And the proportional control law says apply a control which is proportional to this error. So this is, let's say we are only using the P term of our PID controller. What happens then? So we start from x equals to zero, and then we compute the difference to our desired position. In this case, it's one. And then let's say kp, if it's one, just for example, uh, then we would apply a, a control, which is one minus zero, which is one amount of control. And let's say we apply it each time for one second. This would then give a certain velocity to the car and it will start moving. At some point, we see that it does reach the position one, but then it overshoots. And this happens because uh, the, the, uh, the just this term is not able to account for the kinematics of our, uh, of our car in this case. So as it reaches one, it did reach one and it did make the, the position error as zero, but it reached there with certain velocity. And therefore, basically, you can't then just immediately stop here. You need certain time to actually come back. And what this results is in this kind of an oscillation where you're always reaching your goal with certain velocity, which is non-zero, and you're not actually able to stop your car. So for, uh, uh, for, the, for the task of actually driving your uh, car to a desired position, just the proportional terms are not sufficient. Right. And here also we then see that the controls also go left and right. So this would, uh, this would correspond to your, your steering to the left ones, to the right ones, to the left ones and so on. And you're actually never constant or never reaching your desired position. And one can actually fix this by considering the derivative parts as well. So now we say that we have a, a control which not just depends on the, on the distance to the destination, but we also want to make sure that when we arrive to the destination, the velocities are, uh, uh, are is, is equal to the desired one. So in this case, to reach a position, we want to reach there and stop. So the desired velocity would be zero. So we would like to arrive at one with a particular, with a zero velocity. So to say. And when we have these two terms of both the proportional error and the derivative error, then we actually see that we are able to uh, arrive to the position one smoothly and then we are able to basically stop at one. What you see on, on the bottom here are the corresponding controls that were needed to actually achieve this uh, uh, particular performance. And we basically see two components. So this, uh, this pink part here and the light blue part here uh, correspond to the proportional and the derivative uh, components. So this control here is coming due to the fact that uh, you are uh, away from your desired position. And uh, this blue part here is coming from the fact that you have a velocity that's different than the desired velocity. And this dark green part here shows the combined control that's actually being sent to the car. And as a combination of these two controls, we are able to kind of achieve what we want, right? Uh, of course, now the question comes, uh, what to do with these gains. So before I said we just assume them to be one, but in practice we need to decide them. And often it's, 
important to define these or to set these gains properly for your system. So for example, in this case, we have gains, let's say we set gains which are higher than what is necessary. And what this would mean is that, for example, we would oversheet, overshoot our desired position and uh, not stop there and then take some time to actually come back. Ideally, we would like to avoid this kind of a, 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 um, a situation. This, this indicates that, let's say, our proportional error is higher than it's necessary. Right? And therefore, this is one of the effects that we will see if we have uh, uh, much higher gains. Whereas if we do the opposite, if we put two lower gains, what this means that as a, our system takes much longer to actually reach our goal. So there's always a trade-off between how fast you can reach your goal versus how much you would overshoot your desired position. So these are the two things which we need to take into account when we decide these gains KP and KD uh, while using a, a proportional integrative or a PID controller. In this case, we only see the P and D parts. Then why do we need this I part if everything is good? This I part comes in when we have certain systematic error. So this means that let's say there's some external disturbance on your robot as it's moving, or let's say you have wheels which are not exactly symmetric. This would result in you always uh, having some systematic bias. So in this case, for example, uh, even after you are, we have applied our, our P and D control, we are always kind of a little bit away from our desired position. And the idea to fix this kind of error is what the integral term does. So this integral term, what it says is basically take the uh, difference between your desired position and your current position and add it up over your entire history. So zero to T. And what this, this does is uh, basically it would add up this area and ha generate a, a control which is proportional to the, uh, the error or the area under this curve here. And so we see this uh, uh, here where, for example, we start from zero and we reach a particular position and we have a certain, uh, uh, certain uh, uh, error that's coming due to these biases. And then what the integral term does is it basically adds up this area under the curve and then uses this part to actually generate a command and finally lead it to the, uh, the, uh, the desired goal. And once you reach the desired goal, since there is no more any difference from your desired uh, uh, trajectory, the component of the integral part would also decrease very soon. So here again, we see the three parts. So the proportional part, the derivative part, and the integrated integrative part, which would finally give this green thing here in order to, uh, uh, to make our system reach our goal position and to make sure that if there are some external disturbances or some systematic bias, this is also taken uh, care of. Right, so this gives us the overall formulation of our PID controller, where we have the three terms, as I discussed, the proportional term multiplied by the proportional gain, the derivative term multiplied by the derivative gain, and the integral term, uh, which sums up this errors due to systematic bias, also scaled by this gain here. So usually for steady state systems or systems where you're already quite close to your uh, trajectory, this kind of scheme works quite well. But uh, one should be careful of the integral term uh, because sometimes this could add up over time and could lead to dangerous effects, uh, which is also called as the wind up effect. So for example, let's say you're moving and then you're slipping on the road due to some reason. This means that you're not in the position that you expect to be. And over a period of time, this adds up to be a big uh, error, which could then result in a control that is not desirable. Right, so. Uh, uh, apart from that part, uh, apart from this particular danger, which actually you could also uh, take care of by not always integrating over your entire time horizon, but only for a short window. So let's say you only look at the last five seconds and usually this is sufficient to ensure that you don't have uh, very bad wind up effects. Right, so with this, what we have seen is a controller which looks at all these different feedback errors. So each one of this is a feedback error because it's a difference between what you desire and where you currently are. So either the error directly in the position here or the velocities or the thing that you add up over time. And so with this, we have now a control lot to actually uh, take our car to a desired location. So just to give a quick summary, we have three or three components, the P, I, and the D. Most cases, the P part is sufficient if there is no uh, if, you, if you're moving slowly or the kinematics is quite slow and the proportional uh, error is usually sufficient. Uh, or in cases like uh, this case where we had a certain kinematics for the car, 
a PD uh, uh, um, controller is recommended where you can also take into account the velocity of the, the system. And if we have some systematic bias, we should also include the, uh, the integrator. So this is in general, uh, 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 or this is a general feedback controller, uh, this PID controller, which can be used for several tasks, not just of reaching a position, but any kind of process where we want to bring our desired, or bring our system to a, a desired uh, uh, position, so to say, or to a desired uh, value, right? So now let's see how this uh, extends to actually following a trajectory. So what we have seen now is how to actually just reach a point but in practice, uh, when we are in the scenario for a self-driving car, we don't just want to reach different positions, but we want to track this, uh, this particular trajectory smoothly. So this needs certain extensions. And um, the way this is typically done for a self-driving car is to break this problem into a couple of parts. So one part is what is called as the longitudinal control, which means we need to make sure that our velocities are uh, uh, aligned so uh, or, or are the ones that we want to reach and then we also want to make sure that if we are away from this uh, or we are having some offset from this trajectory we want to correct that offset as fast as possible and so these are the two parts the second part is also called as the lateral control and so let's first look at the longitudinal control which means that uh, let's say for, for now we are already aligned with the trajectory that we want to go so we have no error say in the heading or we have no offset but what we want to do is that at each point on this trajectory, we want to achieve a particular velocity, right? And uh, of course, there are multiple ways where, uh, how one can come up with this velocity profile as it's called. One is, uh, for example, when you have a large curvature, it's usually better to have a lower velocity as this would ensure smoother curves or there's not too much jerks. Whereas, let's say when you have flatter, uh, uh, um, flatter parts of the trajectory, you could go faster. Um, this is one way you could come out with what velocity you want at each point. Uh, but also there are certain uh, rules that the environment imposes on you. For example, if the maximum speed of this road is, let's say, 30 kilometers per hour, then you should ensure that you are not going before, uh, behind or above 30 kilometers per hour. So using this information, we can actually uh, or we want to use this information or this velocity profile to come out with a control which actually uh, obtains these velocities at those particular times of point along the trajectory. Right. So the first idea or the idea that we want to see here is how to then use, let's say, this PID controller that we just saw in order to uh, obtain this, uh, this property. Right. Uh, and in this case, we slightly modify our PID controller. In this case, instead of reaching a particular uh, position uh, uh, x desired, we have a, a reference trajectory. And uh, what we do here as a proportional error, we want to have our velocity, which is the x dot here, as close to the, uh, well, uh, the, the, the velocity we want to reach, which was defined by the velocity profile. So this would be our proportional error. Whereas the derivative error would now be the rate of change of this velocity. So this means the acceleration, so to say. So we want to reach there with as little accelerations as possible. And finally, of course, if there are certain biases that are there, uh, we want to also take care of them. So for example, if we set our car to go at 50 kilometers per hour, but it always goes at 53. So these kind of errors would be, for example, taken care by this integral part. Right. And the output would be, in a way, uh, acceleration that our throttle must be able to provide. So with this PID, we get a control, which is in terms of an acceleration that we desire. And the goal is that we either press the throttle or the brake such that we reach this particular uh, desired acceleration. So this is what, we, uh, the, what, what is shown here. So we have a, a reference velocity coming from the, the velocity profile. We use this law here. Uh, of course, I didn't talk about the part that one has to actually set these uh, KP, KD, and KI properly such that, uh, such that these gains allow us to have a performance in terms of the overshoot or reaching our desired velocity as fast as, uh, as possible. And then this would translate to a, a certain amount of push on our brake or throttle to reach this position. So this is how we can use a PID controller to achieve uh, these longitudinal velocities along the trajectory assuming that we have already made our uh, uh, offset errors to zero, right? 
and uh, this would result something like the following here. So once we apply the PID control, we would see that maybe initially, we, if we start from let's say zero and we want to reach to this uh, V ref, so say 30 kilometers per hour, initially maybe we need to give a full throttle here shown by just one. So if it's one, it's full throttle. If it's zero, it's no throttle. And uh, as, as time goes by, uh, we need not put this entire uh, acceleration as, it, as the car achieves certain velocity. And then we probably need to give some constant uh, acceleration so as to keep this velocity because as you move on the road, there's some friction, some other disturbances which need to be countered through the, through the throttle. So basically the PID controller would uh, generate this particular uh, profile here, which would be the one that would be given to the throttle and the brake. This is how we can achieve, let's say, the longitudinal uh, control. Often there's a kind of a trick that's done or kind of an improvement that one can do on this basic PID scheme through what is called as the feed forward controller. Uh, what this uh, essentially means that if we kind of know what's the effect of our, uh, of our control, so we have a mapping between uh, a throttle and a velocity. So if we set a particular, or if we want a particular velocity, what's the throttle that's required to obtain that velocity? So using this information, what you can do is that, for example, we, we obtain this empirically beforehand for the car that we're interested in. And then we can use this uh, feed forward controller for which the reference, of, for which the input is just VREF. So this means that, say we want a velocity which is somewhere here. We look up and we see, okay, this is the throttle that's required to obtain that velocity. That's what this controller spits out. And then the role of the PID control then would be to only do, do the minor corrections. So we want to reach VREF. My chart or my lookup table, so to say, says give this much throttle. I give that much throttle. And then this, the role of the PID is just to give the small changes so as to, uh, to reach our desired positions. Often this kind of uh, PID control, controller, which includes the fee forward term, uh, reaches its goal faster than if you were to track this error entirely from zero. So this is one of the, uh, the ways to make a PID controller respond faster. So this was all about the longitudinal control. Uh, the next control that we see is the lateral one, which essentially means that if we have certain offset with our trajectory, we want to make this to zero. So the term that's often used in, uh, in the literature is what is called as the cross track error. So this is the error so to say perpendicular from your current heading or cu current position to your uh, trajectory. Right. So we want to uh, develop a controller which would make this zero, but we also want this controller to have some other properties such that once we make it to zero, that it's also looking in the correct direction. We not only want to go to the trajectory, but we also want to set the correct uh, heading uh, uh, along that trajectory. So in this case, for example, our current heading is theta. So once we say reduce our cross track error and go on to the, uh, onto the trajectory, we want it to have, let's say the heading of the trajectory itself or the tangents here given by the theta ref of the trajectory itself. So these are the two goals usually one has when we're talking about a lateral uh, control. Again, we can use the idea of a PID control uh, for obtaining this uh, lateral uh, error. So what usually one does is uh, uh, basically the, this error or this cross track error is taken as the thing that we want to uh, bring to zero. So that's why the, the formulation looks slightly different because our desired cross track error is basically zero. And let's say ECTE is our current uh, um, cross track error. This means that basically it's zero minus the current cross track error. Therefore, we basically just have the minus KP times uh, ECTE and the same uh, all over uh, here. So this is very similar to our position control, apart from the fact that our reference is always zero because we always want to make our cross track error zero. And the way this would look for the car is that, how should I move my steering? So the output should here be the rate of change of my steering wheel or the steering angle, such that I can drive this cross track error to zero. And uh, although it's not directly evident here, in practice what happens by, uh, by, by applying this control law is that you not only reach your uh, desired position, but you also reach with the correct heading, which is kind of a consequence of the fact that as you reach closer to the trajectory, 
you kind of also uh, uh, minimize your steering angle which uh, so as to actually reach and not overshoot and even if you overshoot then you would compensate to uh, uh, align with the trajectory so although it's not guaranteed that our heading will be uh, will be aligned with the trajectory in practice if we start close enough to trajectories and the trajectories are smooth, then we obtain this uh, property that we reduce the cross track error, but also directly also align our orientation in the direction that we want. So this then would look like something like this. Over time, we would give some steering. So maybe initially we need quite a bit of steering if you are far away. So for example, uh, if, our, if our cross track error is this high, and then over time as the cross track error decreases, also we see somehow that the steering angle that we need to compute also changes. So very similar to our position control, but in this case, the commands are actually given by our, uh, our uh, steering wheel here. So in both these controllers, there's one thing that we did was that we kind of separated the problem of uh, controlling the uh, the velocity or the linear velocity and the angular velocity so to say as, uh, as, as two different PID problems and we solve them separately and this is how most systems actually do it because it's easy to design controllers for one task and PID controller is quite good at that and therefore this also makes the task for example of deciding the gains uh, easier. Of course this might lead to the fact that you have competing interests in the sense that by decreasing your longitudinal error so the velocity error you might end up or let's say the other way around so by setting a uh, by changing your uh, steering wheel you not only affect the the uh, the angular velocity but indirectly also affect the linear velocity of your uh, of your car and so there is some competing interests of these two controllers but if the gains are suit uh, are properly tuned and if uh, if the range that we are uh, uh, hoping for is small enough, then often this work quite well. Right. So we then uh, move on to the next kind of control, especially for the steering, which is called as the geometric steering control. And we want to do this because uh, in our PID controller that we developed, let's say the lateral PID controller, we actually didn't really exp uh, exploit the kinematic model of our, of our car. So in that sense, the, the output that the PID controller gives, which is let's say the steering rate or to set a particular steering angle, this means that maybe this actually does not um, uphold the, the instantaneous center of curvature uh, uh, assumption that we made. So this means that our car might be skidding instead of rolling smoothly, uh, since we didn't give any importance to the kinematics, so to say. So here we look at a couple of control laws which actually take into account this kinematics or at least look at the geometry of both your car as well as the trajectory to obtain uh, a control law. And the first one of these controllers is what's called as the pure pursuit controller. So again, we have a, a, a particular a trajectory we want to follow. And in this case, we only control again, let's say the lateral aspects. So we only control the steering wheel. And there's one, uh, uh, one term that's introduced with this controller is what is called as this LD, which is the look ahead distance. So instead of directly tracking uh, to the closest point on the trajectory, uh, one of the ideas that this controller uses is to actually look up or look ahead at some point on the trajectory. This often ensures a much smoother behavior than if you're al always trying to go to the closest point on the, uh, on the trajectory. Uh, with this, uh, we obtain the following geometry. So the goal is the following. So for the rear axle, so again here we use this rear axle uh, no, um, uh, coordinate frame. We want this rear axle point to tra uh, track a particular arc such that it intersects with a trajectory at this look ahead distance point. So we want such a control which takes us along this curve. Of course, this curve keeps changing at every instance because let's say we apply this control, we move a little bit forward, our look ahead point on the trajectory would change and this the circle that we would be tracking would always be different, but it would always ensure that we have this ICC point so that we are always rolling. With this, we also uh, get the following geometry such that uh, we have these two, uh, 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 two, let's say, parts of the circle or the, the, the thing that forms the arc, which has the equal length. And we can do some geometry and come out with this controller. So what we exploit here is the law of sines, which essentially means that if you have a triangle like this, the, the sine of this angle 
divided by the, op the length of the opposite, uh, si opposite side of the triangle remains constant. So here we say, for example, this LD uh, divided by the sine of 2 alpha is the same as uh, R or R divided by this angle uh, here, which is given by pi by 2 minus alpha. So you could think of if this is alpha, the whole thing is 90. So this thing is pi by 2 minus alpha. And with this, we come up with this uh, first equation here. And one, with that, we apply some uh, high school trigonometry. So we expand sine 2 alpha as 2 sine alpha cos alpha and sine of pi by 2 minus alpha is nothing but cos alpha. And with some algebra, basically we can come up with uh, uh, expression for our uh, uh, Curvature, the radius of curvature, which is shown here by kappa. So radius of curvature is defined as nothing but one over r, and by doing by manipulating uh, the equation here, we end up with the fact that kappa is nothing but two times sine of alpha divided by the Lukács distance L d. So uh, we derive this, and we'll see why this is useful. So once we have this, which is coming from the geometry that we saw here, which uh, then in turn, make sure that we always have an ICC results in the following uh, control law in, uh, uh, in the sense that we have this uh, constraint that we got in the previous slide where kappa was 2 sine alpha over LD. And if you remember from the bicycle model, we said that we should always set the steering angle such that it's tan inverse of L over R and 1 over R is nothing but the kappa. And uh, then you, we just have to substitute this in here to obtain the control law, so this pure pursuit control law. So which says set my angle such that it's tan inverse of 2L sine of alpha over LD. And it's also quite nice in the sense that tan inverse has the property that it's a monotonically increasing function between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2. This means that we'll spit out a value between minus pi by 2 and pi by 2 for our steering angle. This is quite nice. And we have obtained this from the fact that uh, we are always rolling while we are applying this particular uh, particular control. Right. But uh, uh, or what we want to see in the end actually is that the cross track error is driven to zero. So the question that I ask here is if I follow this particular control law, do I actually make my cross track error zero? And actually there's quite uh, a nice relation that comes out here. So again with some geometry, so this point is, or this length here is the uh, cross track error, uh, which is basically nothing but the, the place where, oh, this is our heading direction and the, the direction perpendicular to it on our trajectory is this cross track error. And if we look here, we have a relation basically, uh, which says the sine of uh, alpha would be, uh, E cross track error over LD, so this part over the hypotenuse, uh, which is the look ahead distance. And uh, these are the two equations that we had from before. And if we, if we plug in the equation, what we end up is that we see that uh, the cross track error ECTE is basically proportional to our curvature kappa. And if we then put that here and then we, we then see is that our steering angle is also directly proportional to our uh, cross track error ECTE. And since tan inverse is a monotonically increasing function, this means that as the uh, cross track error increases, our steering command also increases. So in a way, when we are farther away from our uh, trajectory, we have a more aggressive turning than when we are closer to the uh, so this is in a way telling us that we are reaching towards our, uh, our trajectory by setting the delta as given here. Right. And uh, what we uh, can also do is that still now we had set this look ahead distance as a constant. So whatever, three meters ahead, four meters ahead or so. But often what this happens is that uh, since we are not really controlling the forward velocity at this time, this means that if we are going too fast, this can result in a very fast maneuver to reach our trajectory. So if our look ahead distance is say not long enough, then we want to reach this look ahead distance on our trajectory as fast as possible, resulting in let's say some jerky behavior while uh, reaching our trajectory. And we want to avoid this. And one way to actually do this is to link the look ahead uh, distance uh, to the velocity that we are actually moving at, the forward velocity that we are having. So if 
the look ahead distance is proportional to the forward velocity we are having this means that if we are fast if we are moving faster the point on the trajectory we, wa we want to reach is also farther away resulting in the fact that we can reach there much uh, smoothly than if the look ahead distance per was slower again it also works if our velocity is smaller then it's fine uh, to actually apply uh, strong enough steering so that we reach our trajectory as fast as possible so by setting the look ahead distance as a function of our velocity we finally end up with this law which we can call our pure pursuit law so this is a lateral controller to compute the steering angle and the steering angle is given by the tan inverse of this formula here and now we have linked the uh, look ahead distance to the current velocity there's another popular lateral controller, what is called as the Stanley controller, and it takes its names from the from the robot that it was used to control. And it's a uh, it's a really successful uh, controller in the sense that it uh, won or it helped in winning the DARPA challenge, where the car tracked several hundreds or even thousands of kilometers uh, using this uh, geometric controller again. And the idea with the uh, Stanley controller is the following. So in this case, instead of just reducing the crosstack error, uh, the Stanley controller tries to reduce both the heading error and the crosstack error explicitly. So it says that give me my uh, um, steering uh, wheel command such that it's equivalent to phi. And here phi is nothing but the angle or the, uh, the, the angle of the difference between the current orientation and the orientation of the trajectory at that point. So by setting delta equal to phi, basically we are aligning ourselves to the trajectory. And like before, we also want to reduce the cross-track error. And in this case, they actually propose this uh, formula, so to say empirically, where they say set my uh, steering angle as the tan inverse, like we saw before. And the error is also, like we saw before, uh, in the pure pursuit controller proportional to the cross track error. So this is quite intuitive because in the end, the tasks of both the controller are the same and the fact that we see similar formulas uh, it should not surprise us. Uh, the one big change that happens here is that previously we were tracking the, uh, the center of the rear axle. And in this case, the, uh, the, uh, the developers actually here track the center of the front axle. Although we won't really go into the error dynamics here, they prove that by tracking the center of the uh, front vehicle, they have better error dynamics in the sense that they're able to uh, have an exponential decay in the in the cross track error, especially when these errors are quite or these errors are small enough. So they have these nice properties uh, which are also independent of the velo forward velocity that you're going. So either you're fast or slow, you would uh, end up. Uh, or you would make your cross track error zero in the same amount of time because this leads to an error dynamics which is independent of the uh, forward velocity. And of course, uh, also make sure always that the delta is between our minimum and maximum ranges. So by combining this, the final uh, Stanley law uh, is written like here. So our, the steering uh, angle is my uh, difference to the trajectory heading plus the tan inverse of this term, which includes the uh, cross tracker. And of course, uh, make sure that the delta is between delta min and delta max, and this would ensure that our car would uh, uh, track our trajectory, uh, similar in a way to the, uh, the pure pursuit controller, uh, but also with some other nice properties. Okay, with that, we move to the final kind of control strategy, what is also called as the model predictive control. So now we look at how to pose this control problem as an optimization problem. And we'll see some of the nice properties that this controller, uh, which is also abbreviated as MPC controller, uh, gives us. Right, so again, let's say uh, the main idea of using a model predictive control, as the name suggests, is that it actually uses the model of the system, so how the system evolves over time, in the process of actually choosing a best control. So that's why the name model predictive. So use your uh, model to predict what will happen in the next time instances. And by using this information, can you then pick the correct uh, control law? Right. So here, for example, uh, we uh, consider this, uh, the, the similar task of actually tracking this uh, line at the center of the, uh, of the road uh, um, by basically I take the center line and ensure that we track this trajectory. Because here it's already on the center line, so there's nothing uh, to correct, but if you were having an offset, you want to 
correct this particular offset. Right, uh, then, like I said, so we have our controls, so which are our brake and our accelerator and our steering wheel. And if we know what happens when we apply these controls to our system, so how does the velocity change when I apply my control, or how does my yaw, the heading change when I uh, move my steering, if I know how this works, then I, uh, then I can use the predictions that of these actions to actually choose the best action uh, that I want to do. So essentially this means knowing the kinematics and the effect of the uh, controls on the system and how uh, it evolves. Right? So by applying, let's say, different kind of controls over the next few time steps, we might end up with, let's say, these three different, uh, uh, different trajectories here. And in the end, we want to choose those controls which uh, give me a trajectory which is the closest to the actual trajectory that I want to track here. So here I want to track this green trajectory here. And by choosing the controls which generated, so to say, these red uh, dotted lines here is the control that I want to actually use. Right. So we might ask, we already know how to do this and what's the reason why we need an MPC control at the first place. And one of the nice properties is that we are able to handle multiple inputs and outputs together. Right. So in the sense that if we, thought, if we think of our PID controller, we had a separate controller for, uh, for making sure that we reach the desired velocity and we had a separate controller for making sure that we make the cross track error zero, we make the heading zero and so on. And uh, this means that uh, we have the same system, which is the car in this case we want to control. However, we have multiple controllers to achieve the same task. And with this also there's a complication that since there is certain, uh, uh, or the dynamics is such that this control U1 would also affect the errors of the controller two and vice versa. And this results in the fact that the tuning of the gains might become uh, tricky. And with the, MPC idea, the thing is that we can compress this whole part into one MPC controller, which could, for example, both generate the, uh, the steering wheels as well as the accelerator and braking commands in order to drive our system to a particular position. Right. So this is one of the things that comes naturally in an MPC uh, controller. Of course, nobody stops us from using a single MPC like here for each of the control problem. And also this is something that's, that's done often to keep, for example, the computations uh, smaller. Right. The next uh, reason why MPC is kind of desired is that it handles the constraints as a process of the optimization procedure itself. So before, for example, using a PID controller, if we wanted to limit our speed to let's say 50 kilometers per hour, this would basically would mean just having a threshold and cutting off. So we would put no, or we wouldn't put any more uh, throttle uh, as soon as we see that we have reached 50. So it's in a way hard coded. Whereas in uh, the MPC, you can specify these controls as a part of the optimization problem. So not just controls on the speed, but also for example, uh, we might have maximum and minimum acceleration requirements to ensure that the drive is smooth, for example. And these kind of constraints can be put directly into an, into an MPC based controller, uh, which is also nice. Uh, what is also available, so to say, with an MPC is this idea of a preview, which means that uh, say you have a camera in here and you see the trajectory up to this part. This means that the actions that we uh, take next doesn't just depend on the closest point on the trajectory, but actually looks ahead and therefore can use all this information to come out with the controller, which may be uh, much better than if we just always look at the closest point on our trajectory or even at a look ahead point, but we don't have this knowledge of how the trajectory is changing, right? So for example here, if we want to make this turn uh, uh, smoothly along this corner, uh, if it were, let's say a PID controller, maybe we just realize this curve at this point and then we put the brake at the end point uh, whereas uh, uh, with a, a MPC controller since we have this whole knowledge we can reduce the speed even earlier so as to make this uh, the so as to make this turn smoother than if you j didn't have this preview capability All right so the idea of uh, using MPC or in general the idea of using control as an optimization problem is done in multiple situations. And the thing that is common to these situations of these different techniques is basically that you need to define 
a cost function which describes the objective that we want to minimize, which means we want to reduce our cross track error, we want to put little as little controls as possible, all these things. So these are then put into a objective function and then the goal of the optimization problem would be to minimize this objective function. Of course, depending on the formulation of this optimization problem, there are different techniques which can then be used to actually perform the optimization. But the core idea of the MPC and other such algorithms is to uh, have the control as an output of certain optimization problem. And once we have that, the question that one must ask is then what is a good uh, cost function or a good objective function? And uh, some of the ideas that come straight away are that we want to minimize the error to the reference. So this you could say as the cross track error or this would be, for example, the difference to the, the, the reference velocity that we want. Or this could also be that uh, we can encode the, the objective function in such a way that uh, our controls are limited, so to say. So we don't want to steer a lot. We would prefer to steer a little bit. We would also prefer only to press the accelerator or the brake a little bit rather than having aggressive maneuvers, which is easier on the driver, but also on the passengers as well as the car itself, right? And uh, if we actually uh, write, write that down, what we have is that we will have some system which might be linear on lo or nonlinear. So this is, let's say, the kinematics of the system. So how the system evolves over time. And uh, if it's linear, it's good. We have certain solutions which are even closed form and uh, which is actually a particular form, which is a particular uh, controller, which is called as the linear quadratic uh, regulator or the LQR, which, uh, which can be used. But in this case, we look at a more general case where our systems can be nonlinear, which is the case with our bicycle model or any other model uh, which is realistic to, to, uh, to, uh, to model the motion of a car. And then we basically have a quadratic cost function which uh, takes in the error. So this error could be the difference between our reference velocity and our current velocity. This could be the uh, error uh, in terms of the cross track error. So we could come, out, come up with some error vector which defines, so to say, the errors that we want to actually minimize. And with that, we can come up with this uh, uh, kind of cost function which is a weighted uh, squared sum of your errors as well as a weighted squared sum of your controls. So this way we have an objective uh, that takes into account the error as well as uh, controls. And by minimizing this objective and adjusting the Q and R correspondingly, we can obtain the behavior that we like for our system. And of course, the goal always is to find the control uh, which gives us the lowest cost once we define this cost function. Right. Uh, and as we look at this uh, uh, scheme, basically we see immediately that there are some pros, which is that the cost matrix has this intuitive meaning of a trade-off between your error and the control and gives us different kinds of control that we would prefer in different situations. However, the, uh, the con on the other side is that uh, this kind of controllers usually don't have a closed form solution, unless in very special cases where the system equations or the system dynamics is linear and the constraints are linear or whatever. In most cases, this problem has uh, no uh, closed form solution, which means we must compute this solution online as an optimization problem. And in uh, previously for the uh, applications in slow moving processes, maybe in a chemical factory or so on, this was fine. But for uh, controlling a car where the car expects uh, commands to be given it if not at 10 times a second or even 100 times a second. Uh, this brings challenges in the sense that we have limited computing capability as well as limited time to actually compute this uh, solution. And therefore, what one usually does is that instead of planning this or computing this optimization problem over the entire trajectory length, you only do it for a small portion, uh, which is also called as uh, the planning horizon. So you do it maybe for the next two or three seconds. Uh, uh, also. Right, so uh, when we talk about the requirements for MPC, we require fast processing power, which can be a challenge on, uh, on embedded systems, which are usually what is found on in cars. And we also need certain memory to, to hold the different variables to perform the optimization, but also some lookup tables if we need them. So these are some requirements that we need for our MPC, which 
you wouldn't need if you use a simple PID controller. It's a, a static law. Once we decide the gains, the formula basically does the whole control. There is nothing that's changing online, of course, except the error signal itself. In this case, at each iteration, we are actually solving an optimization problem. And uh, the solution of this optimization problem is the control that we actually give to our system. So if you look at this thing for a self-driving car, we would have our car model, which in this case would be, let's say, the uh, bicycle model that we introduced in the beginning. And then this uh, model will be used uh, in conjunction with the optimizer to come out with certain controls. And in our case, uh, uh, a throttle and a steering control in order to drive our uh, car along a particular trajectory. Right? So at each point in time, uh, we basically use the predictions of our car, car model and then look at, okay, which one of these predictions actually looks like the best solution. And if that is the best solution, what controls actually lead me to this solution uh, are, or is the control that I actually want to apply to the, uh, to the car. Right. So uh, let's actually look at how this MPC works for a simplified problem. So in this case, we won't control both the forward velocity and the steering. So in this case, we'll just control the steering to actually bring this uh, car along this green line. But this doesn't mean that the MPC cannot be used for controlling both the linear and the angular velocity. Just for uh, example and illustrations sake, here we want to set the steering angle such that uh, we track the center of the lane here as well as we can. Uh, we can. <clears throat> right, so like I said, so we have the, uh, the MPC which has the knowledge of the model and then now we want to set my steering angle such that I drive my car at the center of the lane which is the thing that you want to do most of the time. So when you're driving in an urban environment, you are in a lane and you want to make sure that you're at the center of the lane. So this is one of the important problems that one needs to solve. And like I said before, so the MPC has this stage of uh, what is called as prediction or what is we can also call them simulation. What this means is that I simulate certain uh, controls, in this case, certain different steering angles, and this would result in a certain trajectory uh, of my car. And so in this case, I show one example. So if I do these steerings in this particular order, then I might end up with a a trajectory which looks something like this, right? So what I did is that at this point, I am at, uh, uh, at time t, and then by applying those controls which we saw before, I might uh, uh, go along this trajectory as shown by here. So this is a prediction using just the equations from our bicycle model. So we use our car model and to say, okay, this is how I will end up if I apply these particular uh, commands. And the, the the thing is that we do this for multiple uh, uh, multiple of these controls, right? So there's multiple configurations possible, whatever, turn 10 degrees to the left, uh, turn 20 degrees to the left, turn a bit to the right, and many such possibilities uh, that, that are there. And each one of those control sequences would lead to different behaviors of the car. So for example, this would overshoot a bit, this would reach uh, later and overshoot, and this guy probably does what we want, right? So again, we see this uh, in this graph here where if we are at time t, each of these uh, uh, trajectories based on different controls lead us to different uh, movements for the car. All this is still in the prediction domain in the sense that none of these actions have actually been performed, but this is how we expect if we uh, perform certain uh, controls. Then of all these choices that we have, we must choose one choice which, which makes most sense to us. And that is defined here by the cost function that we have. So we define a cost function which sums up these errors or the squared of these errors weighted by the corresponding Q and R terms that we described before. And here we show this, we do this summation for P steps. So this P here is four in the sense that we only do this optimization for the next four steps, right? And once we define such a control law, then comes the optimization step, which means we need to evaluate how good is this sequence of control, how good is this other one, and this other one. Right? So here, just as example, I show that the cost J for making this control is 65. So this cost is computed using this formula given up here. We do the same for all our proposals. 
here I show uh, three proposals and like uh, we see here this particular control sequence results in a cost which is the lowest one and this means that now we want to use this as the solution which would most likely take us to the desired uh, trajectory in the desired manner. And then the next thing that one does in an MPC control is actually then only apply the first of these controls. Although we compute these next few controls, we actually apply just one of these controls uh, in practice and we'll see why this is needed. So we were at, uh, at this position at time t, we chose one particular action which was given by this particular action here which resulted in my new position here at time t plus one and of course this new position that I reached may not be exactly the same as my model predicted maybe there was something some other disturbance that happened there maybe the command was not executed properly and in this case for example we expected to be here or we expected that we would end up here given the control but we ended up somewhere here and we then kind of repeat the entire optimization process considering this as a start of reference. So now we look ahead p more steps. So before we were looking till time t plus p, now we look up to time t plus p plus one. So we always have this kind of moving window of p where we do this optimization. So now the whole optimization procedure which we did from time t equals to at time t equal to t, we would repeat it again at time t equals to t plus one. And uh, we will again choose, do the optimization, choose that control which would then move us closer to the desired position. And we keep repeating this again and again uh, as the car moves and as we see that the, uh, that the front end of, so to say, the horizon also keeps moving with us uh, uh, as the car moves. And uh, it's just a small animation here to kind of see what happens as you move the car. This particular thing that we saw in gray is the, is the horizon that moves. And therefore, in the literature, sometimes it's also called as a receding horizon control or a sliding window control. where We always look up, so to say, p steps ahead of us while we choose the next control action. And the whole optimization problem is solved for those p steps that we have. All right. So like all controllers, also the MPC has certain design parameters. So like when we talked about PID, we had the gains, which were the design parameters. Similarly for MPC, it has its own uh, uh, design parameters. And here I list some of the important ones uh, and we'll see how we can choose them so that they give us the performance that we want. So one of the most important one over the, is the prediction horizon, which uh, basically means this what is the p so how much how many steps ahead do we look, uh, look into so if we look into uh, 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 much farther this means that our uh, um, or if we instead of looking into let's say just next five seconds if we look into the next 30 seconds or next one minute this means that our optimization problem that we would solve would also need to solve for longer and which would take more uh, more computation power so to say similarly we have something called as the control horizon which we'll see uh, what's the relation with the prediction one and we have a uh, sampling sampling time of the controller in the sense that the car expects us to give the commands at a particular frequency and we'll see how this also affects some of the design choices that we make and we'll also see how the constraints and weight affect the overall MPC controller. So let's start with the sample time. Uh, so this sample sampling time essentially means how often do I press my brakes or the uh, throttle and how often do I make my steering commands? And ideally, we want them to be as high as possible. So we want to give commands as, as fast as possible so that this will ensure that uh, if there is some disturbance, I can, uh, uh, I can counter this disturbance as fast as possible. But also in general, to track a trajectory, it's always good to have the control at a high frequency. But the cost is, of course, the computation. If I need to make, uh, 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 or if I need to compute a control command, say 10 times every seconds, I need to solve this optimization problem 10 times every second. And instead, if I now have to do it 100 times, this means that the computation uh, time itself or computation effort is increased by 10 times. 10 times. Uh, and the, and the trade-off we have, for example, is shown in the following uh, example here. So if we have a low sampling time, so let's say we just apply our controls once a second 
and say we were following our trajectory but at some point there was some disturbance so you slipped or something happened there was a wind and you moved away from your trajectory if your sampling time is low this would mean that you would take longer to actually come back to your desired trajectory whereas if you had a high sampling time you would recognize this disturbance immediately and then you would try to correct for it also immediately ensuring in the end that you are not away from your uh, desired trajectory uh, for a long time so this is one of the uh, uh, the trade offs that one needs to do between having too low a sampling time or too high a sampling time uh, to a trade off between your closeness to the trajectory versus the computation effort that's needed uh, the other part is uh, the prediction horizon. So uh, as we saw before, whenever we, we have the system and we have an MPC controller, essentially we are solving this uh, problem over this horizon of P steps. So the controller in a way only has knowledge of these P steps and nothing else. And this means that the, the way we choose this horizon is also important. For example, let's say here we are going around along this trajectory and at some point there is this traffic signal which says you should stop and uh, let's say our uh, uh, horizon, prediction horizon is only of three seconds. However, our dynamics or our, uh, uh, the way uh, actuation works is that we need at least five seconds to reach from our current velocity to zero. This means that having a prediction horizon of three would not help. We would always end up uh, in the fact that we won't be able to stop and we'll only stop somewhere after the uh, after the place where we are actually required to stop. So while choosing the prediction horizon, we should kind of take care that most of the dynamic range of our actuation system is covered. So if we expect that our cars go at whatever 60 kilometers and we are expected to stop within the next three seconds or next five seconds, uh, we should ensure that this particular window is covered while we choose this prediction horizon. Whereas on the other hand, if we take too long a prediction horizon, this means for example, say something unexpected happens much later in the trajectory. Since the, the, the optimization problem is solved for the whole length of your uh, prediction horizon, all the calculations basically made in this part of the trajectory have to be thrown away because something changed about the trajectory and they are no longer valid. So there's always a trade-off between uh, having this prediction horizon again too short uh, such that it doesn't cover the dynamics while being too long uh, the fact that it's probably not useful when you actually apply those uh, controls. So these are two things that needs to be taken care of uh, while deciding these uh, prediction horizons. Of course also the fact that the larger the horizon the larger is the computational time. This is another constraint that we basically have. So this next parameter uh, or design parameter we have is what is the control horizon. So, uh, uh, and here this control horizon is shown by this part M here. So this comes from the idea that typically after applying a few controls, we are uh, quite close to our desired uh, uh, positions or the desired trajectory. And then the controls are usually either zero or very small. And since we are actually solving an optimization problem online where each of these controls, so to say, are the unknowns, the, long, the, the more number of these unknowns, the more is complex is that optimization problem. And one way to control it is that we say, okay, we have a prediction horizon of P, but only for a small part of those prediction horizon do we actually compute some controls. The other parts can either be set to zero or to some constant, uh, which was say, for example, computed in the last time instant. This gives us a way to then minimize the computation time uh, that we have. The limit to this is of course that we can always uh, uh, just compute one. So we can choose a, uh, uh, a control horizon of one. But in practice it's observed that by choosing such a uh, short control horizon, the, uh, the, 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 the nice properties that we want from the MPC can be obtained. So you usually want to have a little bit more than just one. Right. Yeah, so this is what I said. So you mostly have these parts which are zero. So uh, basically we can gain by uh, not considering those during the optimization problem. <coughs> okay, finally we reach uh, the next part which uh, of the design parameters which are the constraints. So like we saw before, we might have constraints on our input. So which means that we can only get so much acceleration from our, uh, from our car or we can only move so much. So these are some constraints that this optimization problem must be aware of. So it shouldn't generate a control which says move whatever uh, 
120 degree steering which is not supported by the car then this means that uh, these kind of constraints must be taken care of while solving the optimization problem. But then there are also some constraints on the output. For example, we want the car to have a maximum velocity or a minimum velocity uh, given, uh, given the road rules and given our trajectory uh, velocity profile, so to say. So typically, uh, it's, it's not recommended to put both these uh, constraints as hard constraints. So you, we have this distinction in the optimization procedure between what's hard constraint and what's a soft constraint. Uh, usually what one does is for the input commands, these constraints are hard in the sense that you actually can't put more control in, therefore these constraints must be, uh, must be obtained uh, or must be uh, uh, followed. Whereas with the output, we are usually a bit more uh, uh, lenient in the sense that if my maximum velocity is 30, but if I go to 32 or 33, it's still okay. So uh, we do this in the fact that because uh, if we keep both of these constraints as hard constraints, it might end up that there is no valid solution which the optimizer can compute. And this means that we have no control for that uh, situation. And since we want to avoid this, we always want to have a control. Maybe it's not the control which satisfies all my constraints, but at least uh, does uh, as well as it can given these constraints. So this way we can uh, choose between hard constraints and soft con constraints while designing uh, or while choosing the constraints uh, for our system. And uh, finally, we'll also look into the aspects of weight. So basically, how should I choose my Q and R uh, to obtain the desired uh, performance? So here, for example, uh, I, uh, I show two situations in which one place where we apply, let's say, more controls and here we apply a fewer controls. This results in two situations uh, which are not in entirely the same. So in this case, we are able to track the error more correctly by applying more control. Whereas in this, uh, in this example below, we end up with some steady state error, so to say, but the amount of control that we put is lower. So now it's up to us as the user to decide what do I prefer more. Do I prefer that I apply more aggressive controls but I'm very close to the desired trajectory or do I prefer that I apply lower controls and as a result I can accept a little bit of error to my, uh, to my desired trajectory. And this basically can be set relatively using Q and R. And what one can also do is for example within Q itself, for example this E uh, uh, computes the let's say the, uh, the difference between the current uh, position of the car and the trajectory. So this could be the X, Y and the heading. Uh, by choosing, let's say, the elements of the diagonal matrix or the, of the, the diagonal elements of this matrix Q, such that, for example, we can give more importance to the fact that we want the X, Y position to be as close, whereas I'm a little bit fine if my orientation or the heading is not exactly correct. So it also allows a trade-off not just between the error and the controls, but also between different kinds of errors and similarly between different kinds of controls if we have, have them. Right, so the uh, ideas that we saw till now usually are applied in the case where we have a linearized system. So this is done mainly from a, a computation point of view because if our system dynamics are linear, and if, uh, uh, if uh, constraints, so to say, are also linear or inequality based and we have a quadratic uh, uh, cost function, then there are very uh, uh, fast solvers that are available, convex optimization methods which can solve these problems. And if you actually want to exploit this for a situation where we actually have a nonlinear system, what one can do is to actually take a nonlinear system and linearize them uh, uh, at the current operating point. So if we are currently at this state, although my system dynamics is nonlinear, I can actually linearize them. So this is in some way similar to the idea of extended Kalman filter where we also do this linearization while we track the state. This is the control equivalent of that where we actually want to uh, linearize our system. And then what we can then do is uh, basically in our uh, model here, we can then uh, use the linearized model rather than the nonlinear model. And then this allows us to then use a more effective uh, optimization techniques that we have in our toolkit. However, if we actually have a, a system which let's say is not so easy to linearize or we have constraints which are nonlinear 
or a combination of both. And for our application, it's not sufficient that we do a linearization. This then means that we must actually solve this nonlinear optimization problem for this prediction time. And in cases where we require, let's say, fast aggressive movements for our car, say in like in a racetrack or so, then uh, we might go for this situation where we actually solve a nonlinear optimization problem every time. But of course, this still means that we need the computation power and some uh, uh, smart solvers, so to say, which can uh, do this. Right, uh, and all, I mean, at each time, the one thing that is kind of limiting us is that since this is an online optimization problem, we would always want to run our uh, optima or our controller as fast as we can uh, possibly do so as to have a high sampling time. And um, basically uh, what we can do is all these design parameters that we saw, the prediction horizon, the control horizon, the sample time, the number of constraints or the number of iterations for which I actually do the optimization. I can decrease all of these. Uh, I will suffer some uh, something in terms of the performance. So if I decrease, for example, the number of iterations, maybe I don't end up at the actual minimum, but just an approximation of the minimum. And maybe given our, uh, our application, it's probably sufficient that we don't do, let's say, 100 iterations of optimization, but only 10 of them. And this way we can basically compromise, so to say, on each of these parameters to make our uh, MPC run faster. So, which is often the case if you want to run it on a car, you want somewhere between 10 to 100 hertz, and you might want to use each one of these uh, tricks, so to say, to make it run faster. There's also another kind of MPC, uh, which is called as explicit MPC, or uh, you can think of it as an offline MPC, where, where basically you compute all these controls in an offline manner. So for, uh, for all the states that you want to achieve, you say, okay, what should be the control? And since we have, in theory, infinite computation power offline, we compute it, and then we basically store all these results on our memory. So we basically bargain the, uh, the, uh, uh, the processing time for memory. By storing all the results that are previously computed, say, in a lookup table, uh, we can actually look them up when we need them. Of course, the idea is quite straightforward, but there's more to the implementation uh, because you might need to actually discretize your space in a way that this lookup table makes sense, or uh, you might need uh, to have some more smart strategies such that we can actually look up this table efficiently and uh, come out with this U1 and U2, which is fast enough for our application. But the general idea is that you can make this computation, so you can make this control computations offline and then look them up which suits for this situation uh, given your current state and the current reference trajectory. Okay, with that, we reach towards the end of this lecture. And before I finish, I just want to give a quick summary of what we covered. So in the beginning, we saw a kinematic model for the car, so the bicycle model, which lets us understand how the, uh, how the motion evolves over time and how controls affect the motion of a car. Then we saw the idea of a feedback control and how we can use the current state and so to say the error signal of the current state to the desired state to actually drive our controllers. And uh, a particular uh, version of this uh, feedback control is the popular PID controller. And we saw how to use this PID controller to both uh, attain a longitudinal uh, controller as well as a lateral controller to drive, let's say, our car along the desired path. And then we saw a couple of uh, uh, strategies for lateral control which are based on the geometry. So we exploit the kinematics of the, the, the robot as well as the trajectory of the or the geometry of the trajectory to come out with some static loss here, but which help us actually drive towards a uh, uh, trajectory in a smooth manner. And finally, we also looked at a dynamic control strategy, strategy where basically this control is computed online every time uh, as the situation comes up. And uh, we saw the particular uh, idea or the implementation of a MPC, a model predictive controller, to achieve this task. And um, if you are kind of interested in uh, exploring more about, let's say, different strategies or even going more in depth at the strategies that we have looked Today, these are some of the resources that you might want to look at. With that, I would like to thank you for uh, your attention and hope that you enjoyed the lecture.